Well, hello everyone. Phil here from the Blue Envelope channel. Yeah, I wanted to make a little video. Uh, this past semester, I took a class on the New Testament in school, and uh, it was one I kind of picked out. I'd watched the Yale has that free lecture series on YouTube about the Old Testament, and that was really interesting. It was really helpful coming from um, kind of the narrow uh, perspective of Jehovah's Witnesses just to find out what current Bible scholars think about the New Testament and when they were written and all that kind of thing. So when I saw they had a New Testament class offered, I thought I would uh, jump on it at my school there. And uh, especially when I saw the textbook was going to be a book by uh, Bart, Dr. Bart Ehrman, uh, just called The New Testament. And it was a pr uh, quite a good little textbook. Now, I quickly found out the first week that my instructor was not a Bart Ehrman fan. He pretty much disavowed the textbook and told us to <laughs> avoid it for all intents and purposes. Uh, I guess he didn't want us, want us uh, to have our faith shaken in any way. But I read it anyways. It was, and it was a good introduction to uh, scholarship on the New Testament anyways. But uh, one thing I will say that I liked about the class is that uh, assignments were things like, go read the book of 1 Corinthians from beginning to end and write down interesting points about it. And it was really interesting just to read Bible books like that from beginning to end with no context or you know certain verses picked out. Um, now, I know we did that a little bit as Jehovah's Witnesses. You, you read maybe three chapters a week as part of the weekly Bible reading. But I know for me personally, that was something I always rushed through pretty quickly because um, I always had about seven other meeting parts to also prepare for on the midweek meeting there. So definitely not something I paid a lot of attention to. And for that matter, you know, as Jehovah's Witnesses, the emphasis is really not so much on reading the Bible itself. It's more on reading the interpretation of the Bible as presented in Watchtower literature. And it's been that way pretty much since the beginning. There's that kind of famous quote. Maybe I'll just read it here. It's from the September 15th, 1910 Watchtower on page 299. And this is what they had to say about reading the Bible versus reading Watchtower literature. It said, if the six volumes of study scriptures are practically the Bible topically arranged with Bible proof texts given, we might not improperly name the volumes the Bible in an arranged form. That is to say, they are not merely comments on the Bible, but they are practically the Bible itself. Since there is no desire to build any doctrine or thought on any individual preference or on any individual wisdom, but to present the entire matter on the lines of the Word of God. We therefore think it safe to follow this kind of reading, this kind of instruction, this kind of Bible study. Furthermore, not only do we find that people cannot see the divine plan in studying the Bible by itself, but we see also that if anyone lays the scripture studies aside, even after he has used them, after he has become familiar with them, after he has read them for ten years, if he then lays them aside and ignores them and goes to the Bible alone, Though he has understood his Bible for ten years, our experience shows that within two years he goes into darkness. On the other hand, if he had merely read the scripture studies with their references and had not read a page of the Bible as such, he would be in the light at the end of the two years because he would have the light of the scriptures. Unquote. So that was the take in 1910, and it's the same today. There's a more recent quote from the June 1st, 1985 Watchtower on page 20. It said, To turn away from Jehovah and his organization, to spurn the direction of the faithful and discreet slave, and to rely simply on personal Bible reading and interpretation is to become like a solitary tree in a parched land. So, with that uh, background as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, it was really interesting to just read through the Bible. Uh, one thing I definitely noticed reading through the New Testament, the Greek, the Greek scriptures, one thing that comes through pretty loud and clear is that all Christians are going to heaven, if you, know, if you believe what the Bible has to say. Um, there's no two groups at all that pop up in your reading there. Uh, it's one thing that actually kind of bums me out a little bit sometimes on some XJW posts is when they're talking about all the new partakers at the memorial each year and like, what are these people thinking? They're nuts coming out. They're 40 years old and think they're going to heaven, that kind of thing. And 
I kind of think about it the other way. I think the idea that any Christians that any Christians that aren't going to heaven is actually kind of the weird idea. And so if there's, you know, young or newer Jehovah's Witnesses that uh, start partaking of the emblems, it's, it's actually returning to a more accurate understanding of the Bible. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. Um, we'll have to see which way the numbers go in the coming years. But that was definitely somebody like Ray Franz. That was his position that you didn't need all the literature. You just needed to read the Bible and that all good Christians would be going to heaven. So, yeah, it's kind of it's interesting. But the main thing I wanted to talk about today is Romans chapter 16. And this is the last chapter in Romans. And it's one of those chapters where there's long lists of names in there of people that Paul is greeting. And it's definitely one of those chapters that I just skip through often when reading, uh, doing the Bible reading. But it's interesting that as you'll actually look at the names there, that there's several dozen people that Paul mentions by name, and almost half of them are prominent women in the first century congregation. It was funny because when I was looking up to see if witnesses still do a weekly Bible reading, which it does seem like they do, that in the meeting workbook, there was actually just a talk a couple weeks ago on the midweek meeting that was based on Romans chapter 16. So the title in the uh, workbook was How Can Sisters Reach Out? And then it was paired with a video that was titled Women Who Are Working Hard in the Lord. And that title was taken from Romans 16, 12, which says, Greet Trephena and Trephosa, Women Who Are Working Hard in the Lord. Now, there was one sentence I noticed in the article. It said, although sisters cannot serve as elders or ministerial servants, they can still set goals in the congregation. So that's certainly not a new thought for Jehovah's Witnesses. Women have never been able to be elders or servants anytime recently, for sure. Um, but it's definitely pretty interesting for several reasons, um, particularly, for example, when you read Romans 16 and verse 1. So let's check that out. So in the New World Translation, that says, I am introducing to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a minister of the congregation that is in Sencria. Now, as a witness, you read that and you think, oh, yeah, she was a, a minister in the congregation. All Christians are ministers. We all preach door to door. But it's kind of interesting that the Greek word in this verse is diakonos, which is the exact same Greek word that the New World Translation renders in other verses as ministerial servant. Just to mention, witnesses are really the only ones that translate that word ministerial servant. Um, most other translations just use an actual transliteration of the Greek word diakonos, and that gives us the English word deacon. So, um, and in fact, some Bible translations just, that's how the verse reads. So, for example, in the New International Version, in Romans 16, 1, the verse reads, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sencria. And the footnote reads, The word deacon refers here to a Christian designated to serve with the overseers or elders of the church in a variety of ways. Similarly, in Philippians 1.1 1, 1 and 1 Timothy 3.8 and 12. So, it raises an interesting question. Were there female deacons, female ministerial servants, in the first century congregation? I think that's definitely a conclusion you can reach pretty easily. And we do know that women actually played a number of prominent roles in the early congregation. So one good example of that is in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and 5. It says there, Every man who prays or prophesies with something on his head shames his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered shames her head. For it is one and the same as if she were a woman with a shaved head. Now, that's a familiar verse to witnesses, and usually we always focus on the second part of that, that women need to wear head coverings. But interestingly, what does the first part of the verse tell us? Well, it tells us that women in the congregation then were prophets and praying just the same as men were prophets and praying. Paul's only stipulation there, it wasn't that women could not pray or prophesy in the congregation. It was just that they needed to have their heads covered when doing so. Now, it gets kind of confusing because just three chapters later, in chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, um, Paul has a really different tone about women there. And so there it says, Let the women keep silent in all the congregations, for it is not permitted for them to speak, 
Rather, let them be in subjection, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the congregation. So, kind of getting mixed messages here. How can he be talking about women praying and prophesying one moment, and then the next moment saying it would be disgraceful even for them to open their mouth? So there's different takes on this. You know, some Bible scholars take the view that Paul himself was actually for the equality of the sexes in the congregation. And those verses in chapter 14 were actually inserted by later um, Christian writers as Christianity evolved away from Paul's model into the more traditional patriarchal model. And that's kind of the viewpoint that Bart Ehrman takes in his book. And then there's others. Um, kind of Christian apologists who say, no, no, that's not how the Bible works. Paul wrote the whole letter, but it makes sense because we want to think that Paul was addressing specific problems in the congregation in Corinth. So in JW terms, this letter was almost like a local needs part to the congregation. So in chapter 11, verse 21, he addresses the specific problem they were having with the Lord's evening meal, where some people were showing up drunk and others were showing up hungry. In chapter 14, verse 27, he addresses this problem of, well, what if several people want to speak in tongues at the meeting? In chapter, in verse 30, he addresses the problem of, well, what if somebody gets an inspired revelation while another one is prophesying during the meeting? And then in verse 35, the idea is that he's talking about some women who are turning the worship services essentially into question and answer sessions and kind of derailing the the direction of the meeting. So Paul here is saying, guys, uh, don't bring up those questions during the meeting. Save them and talk about them afterwards with your family. So that's a couple ways that folks explain Paul's writing about women uh, nowadays. Now, when you read the Insight Books entry on Phoebe, the society starts with the assumption that there can be no female deacons or ministerial servants. And so then going from that point, then they explore well, what Paul must have meant when he wrote that Phoebe was a minister. So that's kind of their take on it. So that's one interesting verse about female leadership in Romans 16. But I want to go to even more interesting one in verse 7. Romans 16, 7. I'll take a page from Lloyd Evans' recent series on uh, New World Translation verses that have been doctored. And so we'll take a look at it first uh, from some translations on BibleHub.com. So the New International Version renders that verse, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. New Living Translation, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who were in prison with me. They are highly respected among the apostles and became followers of Christ before I did. English Standard Version, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Berean Study Bible Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Berean Literal Bible Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, and who were in Christ before me. King James Bible Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. And the New American Standard Bible Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsfolk and my fellow prisoners, who are outstanding in the view of the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So that's how the various translations render it there. Now let's look at how it's rendered in the New World Translation. It says, Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives and fellow prisoners, who are men well known to the apostles and who have been in union with Christ longer than I have. So definitely some changes there. Now, first of all, you probably notice that the name changes there from Junia, which is a female name, to Junius, a male name. So it was only the New World Translation and the Berean Literal Bible that used that name Junius. Now this is quite noteworthy because many Bible scholars understand this verse to say that it's saying that Junia and Andronicus were outstanding apostles in the first century. So the big question, was there a female apostle back then? 
And this was something we had to study a little bit for my class. Now we can back up a little bit and go to maybe a more basic question initially. And that is, how many apostles were there exactly back then? So we know obviously there was the 12 apostles that Jesus picked. And then Judas Iscariot was gone and he was replaced by Matthias. So now we're up to, depending how you count, 13 apostles. Then you've got Paul, of course. So now we're at 14 apostles. Now in Hebrews 3.1, it says, Consequently, holy brothers, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest whom we acknowledge, Jesus. So Jesus was an apostle. So that's 15. Then in Acts 14.14, 14, it says, However, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they ripped their garments and leaped out into the crowd and cried out. So Barnabas was an apostle. That's 16. And then in 2 Corinthians 8.23, it says, If though there is any question about Titus, he is my companion and a fellow worker for your interests. Or if there are questions about our brothers, they are apostles of congregations and a glory of Christ. So here Paul mentions that there is this unknown additional number of apostles, apostles of congregations. And Paul also warns in that letter that not all the apostles floating around back then were totally awesome. So in chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, he says, I have become unreasonable. You compelled me to, for I ought to have been recommended by you. For I did not prove to be inferior to your super fine apostles in a single thing, even if I am nothing. Indeed, the signs of an apostle were produced among you with great endurance and by signs and wonders and powerful works. So where does that get us? Well, uh, so depending whether you count Judas Iscariot or not, there were at least 15 or 16 apostles named by name in the New Testament. And then you have this unnamed additional group of apostles of congregations. So there was lots of apostles back in the first century CE. So now we'll go back to Romans 16, verse 7. And so again, first of all, let's look at the names. Paul speaks of Andronicus and Junia. And so there's this question, was Junia a woman? Well, there's a couple points we can say. Point one, the male name Junius is almost unknown among the archaeological records in the Roman Empire. On the other hand, the female name Junia is quite a common name. Point two, how did the very early Christian writers interpret this verse? Did they assume that Junia was a woman or a man? Well, unanimously, they considered Junia to be a woman. So we have Origen of Alexandria. He was a Christian scholar who lived around the year 200, so very early, and he wrote of Junia as a woman. Incidentally, also, he wrote of her as an apostle. Then we have John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople. He lived in the late 300s, and he wrote this about Junia. So he starts out by quoting the verse, Greet Andronicus and Junia, who are outstanding among the apostles. He continues, To be an apostle is something great, but to be outstanding among the apostles? Just think what a wonderful song of praise that is. They were outstanding on the basis of their works and virtuous actions. Indeed, how great the wisdom of this woman must have been that she was even deemed worthy of the title of apostle. So quite an interesting quote there. The, uh, the Wikipedia entry on Junia actually has a pretty good summary of the understanding of Junia's gender over time. It says, All others in the first millennium of the ancient church also took the name to be feminine, as Bernadette Bruton demonstrated in her 1977 article on Junia. Bruton points to the first commentator on the passage, Origen of Alexandria, who in the second century CE assumed the name to be feminine. She points to additional early Christian commentators, all of whom gave no indication of doubt that the epistle referred to Junia and that she was a woman and an apostle, including Jerome, 4th to 5th century, Hatto of Vercelli, 10th century, Theophylact and Peter Abelard, both 11th century. Bruton affirms that the earliest instance of someone taking the name to be masculine is Egidius of Rome in the 13th to 14th century but demonstrates that the name was not commonly seen as masculine until well after the Reformation. Likewise, the most ancient New Testament manuscript versions, e.g. the Vulgate and Old Latin, all read Junia. 
The name Junia was also provided as the most likely reading in the Nestle Aland Greek New Testament from its inception in 1898 until its 13th revision in 1927, at which point, without any new manuscript evidence to bring about the change, the preference changed to the male Junius. Junia was not restored until its 27th revision in 1998. So, as the article indicates, early church fathers definitely understood Junia to have been a woman. Then, beginning in the Middle Ages, there was a shift to thinking that maybe it was actually a man. And now, at this point, the pendulum has swung back, and almost all Bible scholars feel that Junia was indeed a woman. However, as we see, the New World Translation has continued to stick with the male name Junius in its 2013 revision, and in fact tries to drive home the point even further. You see the phrase in the verse, Andronicus and Junius, my relatives and fellow prisoners, who are men. (laughs) So they insert that phrase, who are men, even though those words are nowhere to be found in the original text. And in the end, the verse is so male dominant in the New World Translation that it's doubtful witnesses even realize there is any debate about Junia's gender, much less that it has come down on the side of her being a woman. So the understanding that Junia was a woman then raises a second question. Whoa, are we saying that there was a female apostle in the first century? Well, as we saw, very early Christian scholars like Origen and John Chrysostom understood it exactly in that way. Now, this is more difficult for some uh, even modern day Christians and scholars to accept. And so we kind of see a split if we look at those verses on Bible Hub, a split in the way various Bibles translate this verse. So some say Andronicus and Junia were outstanding among the apostles. That is, they were apostles, and then they were outstanding even among that group. Other Bibles render it as the New World Translation does, that they were well-known to the apostles. So, what can we say about this? Well, point one, let's actually go to the Kingdom Interlinear. So, that's published by Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, and it has the Greek text of the Bible from Westcott and Hort, along with a literal word-for-word translation of what the Greek words are. So it reads a little disjointed because of that, but it's, it's, uh, so let's check it out. So Romans 16, 7, it says, greet you Andronicus and Junius, the relatives of me and fellow captives of me who are notable ones in the apostles who also before me have become in Christ. So you notice in this Bible that Jehovah's Witnesses published, it, the Greek doesn't say that they were notable ones to the apostles or in the view of the apostles. Rather, they were notable ones in the apostles. That is, they were apostles and they were outstanding even among that elite group. And this is the conclusion that many other scholars have reached in understanding this verse. Now, another point Uh, scholars who feel that, yes, Junia was an apostle, have pointed out that there was really never any discussion about the apostleship of these two, Andronicus and Junia, until it became evident that Junia was a woman. And then folks were like, hang on a second, there can't be a female apostle. And that got into the second uh, debate. Point number three. Now, there was a research paper on this subject that was published last year in the Journal of Biblical Literature by a scholar named Yi Jan Lin, and the title was Junia, an Apostle Before Paul. And Lin's position in the paper is that, yes, Junia was an apostle. And he makes several interesting points. He points out that as you read the New Testament, Paul never considers himself to be really especially close to the 12 apostles or or linked to them in any super close way. They were kind of off doing their thing, and then he was always kind of off doing his own thing as an apostle. So Lynn makes the point that Paul would not have uh, really appealed to the opinion of the 12 apostles as an awesome reason that the Roman congregation should respect Andronicus and Junia, that that wasn't something that was important to Paul, what the 12 apostles thought about something. 
And then Lynn makes a second point that w- usually whenever Paul speaks about himself as being an apostle, he kind of always has the same pattern where he talks about the other apostles and then he always mentions himself as the least apostle or the last apostle. It's kind of funny because the words on the page are very humble, but the effect is that Paul is always bringing up his apostleship. He's always kind of, hey, by the way, did I did I mention I'm an apostle? So uh, I got a kick out of that. But when you look at that pattern of how he writes about his apostleship, this verse would certainly fit that pattern if Andronicus and Junia were apostles. So Paul writes that he's the newest, the last apostle, since these two were apostles in Christ before he was. Now, I had to, uh, as part of this course, I had to watch several Christian or apologist videos discussing women's role in Christianity. And there was one interesting one by a Dr. Ben Wayman, and he pointed out that in the end, it's not the Bible, which is the main roadblock for women being ordained and filling roles as bishops and deacons, or in JW terminology, as elders and ministerial servants. He points out that in 1976, there was a pontifical biblical commission or, uh, convened by the Catholic Church. So that's sort of the Catholic Church's main core group of Bible scholars. And they delved into this question of whether women can be ordained as priests. And they concluded at the end of it, 17 to 0, that based on the New Testament, women cannot be barred from the priesthood. Rather, they concluded that any ban on women in leadership roles in Christianity would have to be because of church tradition. So the idea that Jesus was a man, he chose 12 men to be his apostles, and so men still have to fill leadership roles today. Now, Dr. Dr. Wayman points out the flaw in this reasoning is, uh, for example, Jesus and his apostles were all Jewish Does that mean that only Jewish men can be leaders in the church today? Or you could say they all had beards. Do we conclude that only men with full beards can be elders and ministerial servants today? Definite no on the the Jehovah's Witness end of things there. But it's just so interesting that unlike there's many Protestant denominations nowadays which have kind of followed the evidence of what the Bible says, text actually says, and they now allow women to be pastors, to be ministers and leaders in their churches. And yet here we have Jehovah's Witnesses coming down, funnily enough, on the side of the Roman Catholic Church, siding with centuries of religious tradition to bar women from these leadership roles in the congregation. It's so funny because witnesses are always talking about how their religion is the return to true Christianity, the way it was practiced right after Jesus was on earth, before that great apostasy happened and everything went sideways. And yet, when it comes to women, they hold these doctrinal positions that were only introduced into Christendom centuries or even millennia after the first century came and went. So, yeah, go women. <laughs> So that was just something I learned in my New Testament class that I thought was kind of interesting, and I wanted to throw it out there. Uh, Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, Subscribe if you like for more videos down the road, and we'll catch you in the next one. Take care now.